So thank you again. Um, and also thank you to the organizing uh, committee um, for allowing me to speak on this topic. Um, let me see if I can actually advance the slide back. Good. And um, thank you um, to the organizing committee um, for the opportunity to speak in this wonderful um, series um, on frontiers and liver disease. Um, I would have loved to have visited your country again, and hopefully we'll be able to do so once this um, pandemic is over. Um, so my topic this evening is on hepatitis B, and it's a topic which I hold dear to my heart. Um, so despite oral antiviral therapy being available for over two decades now, and we're seeing a decline in chronic hepatitis B as a primary liver disease indication for liver transplant, and you can see on this black line here a steady but significant decline over the years since antiviral therapy has been available. And however, it still is remaining the most common primary liver disease for liver transplantation in many parts of the world, including Asia and including Hong Kong, where I live. We are seeing more of older age patients as indicated by this blue line here, and we're seeing less decompensated cirrhotics, the red line here. And however, we are seeing an increasing cases of hepatocellular carcinoma. And although liver transplantation is curative for cirrhosis, liver failure and hepatocellular carcinoma, remember it is not a cure for chronic hepatitis B infection. The hepatitis B virus can still reside in the extrahepatic sites, and hence lifelong antiviral prophylaxis is still required to prevent reactivation. Now, there's been many, many debates and studies looking at the efficacy of different antiviral regimes, and the results have all been somewhat conflicting. And I think this is largely due to the uh, limitations in the uh, definition of hepatitis B recurrence after transplantation. But you have to remember that a negative hepatitis B service antigen does not equate to eradication of the hepatitis B in a patient that has been chronically infected. And if you turn it around, that means that a positive service antigen after transplantation does not actually mean recurrence of a hepatitis B infection. In fact, the patient is already chronically infected and has never been cured in the first place. However, most studies have based their outcomes on recurrence based on the service antigen status, whereas one must also remember that long-term graft and overall survival still remains the most important clinical endpoint. Now, this slide shows you all the current available antiviral regimens in use by different liver transplant centers and all the different permutations that is possible is on the right side. And there's currently no general consensus as to which regimen one should adopt. And also for those using HBIG, what dose you should be using, the duration, and also the um, target antibody levels that you should be aiming for to be so-called protective. It is likely that the regimen used at each of these individual centers is actually based on histor historical protocols, which has been evolved upon, and also the cost and also the availability of each of the agents. Um, and you can see that, in fact, the blue part, you can see that the regimens are actually built upon the essential backbone of nucleoside and nucleotide analogs made up of antagavir, tenofovir, or both together, together with a different HBIC approach, ranging from long-term use, limited duration, perioperative use, and to using no HBIC at all. And although one can argue and argue about which regimen is superior, I can totally assure you that all of these regimens are, in fact, highly effective. Now, some clinicians may be very apprehensive about not using HBIC at all because the protocols they have been using have always incorporated HBIC and they're a bit reluctant to see the scope. In fact, the Queen Mary Hospital at our centre, Liver Transplant Centre, is all we've always adopted the completely HBIC free protocol and approach, whereby we don't use any HBIC preoperatively, we don't use any perioperatively, and we don't use any postoperatively. So we don't actually use any HBIC at all in our transplant for chronic hepatitis B. Back in the days of lamivudine, back in the late 90s, the disadvantage, of course, is with the high resistance rate with subsequent virological rebound. Therefore, it is not surprising that HBIG actually at that time was widely used at this point worldwide because lamivudine monotherapy has been associated with increased risk of resistance and virological rebound. And fortunately, not long after, a adafavir became available and was effective for those who developed resistance and was used in combination with lamivudine. Nowadays, we have highly potent um, antiviral drugs such as antagavir and tenofovir with minimal risk of resistance. And therefore, the use of HBIC, I think, has become much more questionable than when we were and when we we're using these newer agents. And over the next few slides, I will present to you the data on outcome of chronic hepatitis B patients who have undergone liver transplantation and received a completely HBIC-free regimen for antiviral prophylaxis. 
when you're using a nuclear side nucleotide analog only approach, you can see that even without using any HPIC at all, the majority, in fact, will undergo surface antigen seroclearance. But we also know that this doesn't mean that the patients are cured from hepatitis B, and therefore long-term prophylaxis is still essential to prevent reactivation. So again, if the patient remains surface antigen positive after transplant, it doesn't mean that they have a recurrence. As liver transplant patient, as I alluded to you before, doesn't cure the infection. And when we actually do quantification of the surface antigen after transplant for those who are surface antigen positive, you can see that the surface antigen levels are in fact at very extremely low levels. And, um, and because a lot of our patients present with severe acute flares, a lot of these patients actually go into transplantation with a high viral load at the time of surgery. And in fact, you can see only about a quarter of the patients who, um, who underwent transplant had undetectable HPV DNA at the time of surgery. And despite this, most of these patients will have service antigen seal clearance and almost all will have complete viral suppression after liver transplantation. And when we look at the long-term outcomes, we can see that the service antigen seal clearance is sustainable out of eight years, over 90%. And if you look at HPV DNA suppression, again, it is durable. We're talking at 100% at eight years after liver transplantation. And of course, the most important clinical outcome is the long-term survival of patients after transplant. And on the, on the right side, you can see that the overall survival of these patients were 85% after nine years um, after transplant for hepatitis B without any deaths related to hepatitis B reactivation when using a completely HPIG free regimen with antagonist alone. And I can assure you that if we did use HPIG in these patients, giving HPIG would not have improved their survival in any way whatsoever. Now, there's always a concern that a higher number of patients um, will remain service antigen positive after transplant if you don't use HPIG. An argument that it is therefore less effective because more patients are service antigen positive if you don't give HPIG. And I've already explained to you about two points. One is that service antigen positivity does not mean HEP-B recurrence. And secondly, even if it is positive, it is at a very low level when you measure it quantitatively. Now, if we give these patients service, if we give these service antigen positive patients HBIG, of course, it will bind onto the service antigen, form complexes, and therefore it will render it undetectable. But it is unlikely that this will translate to any clinically meaningful benefit. When we biopsy our service antigen positive patients, we do not see any positive staining in the liver for service antigen. And indeed, there was no histological evidence of hepatitis B related graft hepatitis. All of these patients remain HPV DNA negative. And furthermore, when we look at the liver stiffness um, of uh, all our patients after transplant, we did not find any uh, difference um, in liver stiffness uh, between those who were uh, service antigen negative and between those who were in, uh, service antigen positive. However, unfortunately, a lot of studies, I think, still, um, including the meta analysis and also systemic reviews, they have included older drugs such as lamivudine, which, as you can see, is associated with a significantly higher rate of virological rebound due to the uh, resistance development. And I think, therefore, the most important aspect of using oral antiviral therapy when you're using it after transplant is to use one with high barrier to resistance. And really, there's only two choices that you should be using, which is integravir or a tenofovir-based treatment. But even for those with pre-existing drug resistance, an HPIC free regimen um, using newer oral antiviral agents is still highly effective and also associated with very excellent long-term outcome, as you can see here. When we look back at our patients who, were, who had lamivudine resistance at the time of transplant, using a completely HPIC free regimen was still associated with an excellent long-term outcome at 85% at 11 years. So it was time we have observed a uh, shift uh, in a uh, paradigm shift um, from using a very high dose of HPIG um, to low dose intravenously, then intramuscularly, and then talking about um, limited duration HPIG withdrawal after a, a duration of period of therapy, and then to a completely HPIG free approach. And a trend towards using uh, less HPIG really stems from, from the fact that you know, we have now it is, it is more costly and um, the patients are required to come back uh, for regular injections to top up to, the, uh, to an arbitrary uh, protective um, antibody titer. And of course, the shift towards using less and less HPIG is only made possible with the availability um, of these highly more potent 
antiviral therapy with minimal risk of resistance. So far, we can see that the current um, existing prophylactic strategies are highly effective in suppressing hepatitis B and preventing reactivation and also with uh, preventing graft hepatitis. And this all results in excellent long-term survival, as I've shown. However, the current oral antiviral therapy is still ineffective in eradicating hepatitis B completely, and hence lifelong therapy is still required. So in short, hepatitis B still cannot be cured with the current available nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. Uh, which brings me into this diagram, which shows you the cascade of cure. And this ranges from viral suppression, where the viral replication is suppressed, to partial cure, whereby patients can actually stop the antiviral therapy, for instance, after E antigen seroconversion, but will still have low level viral replication, to functional cure with surface antigen seroclearance, but still with viral CCC DNA and integrated DNA, down to complete cure with clearance of the CCC DNA, but still with the presence of integrated viral DNA, and finally what we call a sterilizing cure with elimination of all viral particles. Now, the current existing antiviral therapy that we have is highly effective in viral suppression. Most of our patients on antiviral therapy will have undetectable HPV DNA after a certain level of therapy. However, it is not very effective in inducing a partial cure and rarely effective in inducing a functional cure with loss of surface antigen. The rate of surface antigen seroclearance is probably closer to 1% to 2% per year for patients on antiviral therapy. Um, and one of the reasons why our nucleoside and nucleotide analog is only able to control replication but not cure is because it only acts on the downstream site in the hepatitis B replication cycle over here. Now, the highly stable viral particles inside the nucleus, the CCC DNA, and the, continues to serve as a, as a reservoir of infection and a template for viral protein synthesis. And from the replication cycle, you can see that in fact, there are many potential targets for antiviral um, agents to act on, uh, from starting from viral entry to CCDNA expression, transcription and translation of viral proteins, packaging of the viruses down to the release of the virus. And also don't forget also about um, in modulating the host immune pressure in um, trying to control the long-term uh, viral replication. So I will go through some of the targets and the available data starting off with viral entry. And this diagram shows you that the virus enters the hepatocyte via the NTCP receptor. And the most studied agent to inhibit hepatitis B virus entry is a compound called Mercudex. This is a synthetic lipopeptide, uh, which blocks attachment of viral pre-1 S1 protein onto the receptor by competitively binding onto NTCP, blocking the entry of hepatitis B. And also it blocks hepatitis delta virus. Although it appears not to have much effect on reducing surface antigen and also hepatitis B DNA, it was shown to reduce hepatitis delta of RNA significantly. And I think this may actually be an important treatment um, option for patients with delta virus co-infection in the future. Interestingly, for, for liver transplants, uh, for the field of liver transplantation, cyclosporin and its analogs have also been shown to be uh, have some effect in the in the NTCP receptor and thereby can also reduce to a degree the uh, entry of hepatitis B and hepatitis D virus. Another potential target is the targeting the transcription and translation of viral proteins through the use of what we call RNA interference or RNAi. And by reducing the viral protein production and also the viral antigens, it may be possible to reverse the immunoparesis that can be observed with high viral antigen loads. The hepatitis B RNA, as you can see here, has four transcripts which overlap. So you can actually design a drug to target these overlapping sequences. And these drugs are either siRNAs, small interferon RNA, or ASO, what we call anti-sense oligonucleotides. And what they do is they bind onto the target RNA, and once bound, they can promote RNA degradation. You can see more clearly on the next slide, these siRNAs are actually very small, highly negatively charged, hydrophobic, double-stranded oligonucleotides, which mean they actually need a, a highly effective delivery system to enter the liver cells and protect it from um, nucleolytic enzymes as such. So they also need parenteral administration as it is rapidly digested within the GI tract. So one is a peptide carrier, and another example is a lipid-based um, carrier system, delivery system. 
So as you can see, once inside the hepatocyte, the siRNA is then loaded into the risk complex, which is the RNA-induced silencing complex. And, and then the passenger strand is removed, and so now it can target the specific viral mRNA strands, leading to cleavage and then subsequent degradation of the viral mRNA. And one such compound is uh, called JNJ3989, um, which targets two um, RNA um, trigger points. Um, and the results of this compound was actually um, recently presented in the European meeting earlier this year. This compound, given at a three monthly dose, um, resulted in profound and sustained service antigen reduction up to 48 weeks after treatment. For responders, you can see that there's a significant decline, but even for their, what they termed non-responders, you can still see a significant, uh, albeit less decline in the service antigen while in treatment. And you can also appreciate the corresponding uh, decline in hepatitis B RNA, the E antigen, and also with the correlated antigen. And another two compounds were also presented in the same ESL meeting earlier this year. One was called VIR2218. Um, two monthly injections of this compound um, with escalating doses uh, resulted in a dose proportional reduction in service antigen levels. And this service antigen reduction was still observed until at least 16 weeks after the last dose was given. And the other new siRNA compound, RG6346, also showed a very promising service antigen reductive effect with a four monthly in, uh, injection uh, regimen and with a significant reduction in service antigen level compared to placebo. Remember, oral nucleoside and nucleotide analogs really produce service antigen decline as such. They can cause rapid decline in hepatitis B DNA, but usually they have no effect on, or very little effect on the surface antigen level. Another potential target for antiviral therapy is the, uh, is the hepatitis B core protein, which is essential for uh, genome packaging. And compounds, these are compounds known as CPAMs, or core pro protein allosteric modulators, um, can de destabilize the hepatitis B core protein assembly process. And there's essentially two groups of CPAMs, class one, results in aberrant nucleocapsid formation, whereas class two CPAMs results in empty nucleocapsid devoid of any virus genome. In addition, these CPAMs can also inhibit the recycling of relaxed circular DNA back into the nucleus, and hence they can actually reduce over time the overall CCC DNA pool. And in a phase one, trial of a compound called NVR3788. In fact, this was the first prototype CPAM. You can actually see a significant reduction in both HBV DNA and HBV RNA in a dose-dependent manner. And this appears to be somewhat augmented when you combine the CPAM with pegylated interferon. And another phase one uh, study published earlier this year on another um, CPAM called Vibicavir, um, another novel CPAM, again, showing significant reduction in HEP-B DNA and also HEP-B RNA. So the results for novel direct active antivirals for hepatitis B appears to be very promising and very well tolerated. So moving away from the DAAs, I will spend the remaining short time focusing on the uh, immunotherapeutic strategies. The chronic infection of hepatitis B virus occurs uh, with underlying persistent um, hepatitis B-specific immunological dysfunction. You get exhaustion of the hepatitis B-specific T cells, you get poor um, activity, uh, cytotoxic activity, and you also get the impaired cytokine production together with high expression of the inhibitory molecules. Therefore, immune restoration may actually potentially lead to a functional cure once the immune deficit is reversed. And there are several ways to do this. You can huh? stimulate the innate system, e.g. by the use of these uh, T toll-out receptor agonists. You can bl block the immunosuppressive pathways, or you can encourage production of viral uh, neutralizing antibodies, such as uh, the use of therapeutic vaccines. And I'll provide you examples of some of these. This diagram shows you the stimulation of the toll-out receptors using TLR agonists which then leads to activation of these downstream signal pathways resulting in overall increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, interferons, which all of these are important in virological control and also in viral clearance. And also, they can also increase and 
enhance the uh, the function of hepatitis B specific T cells again, hopefully um, to enhance virological control. An example of a toll light receptor agonist was presented again in ESO earlier this year using 24 weeks of a compound called selgatolimod in virally suppressed patients. These are patients already on um, oral nucleoside or nucleoside analogs. And you can see the waterfall plots showing the reduction of surface antigen at week 24, and also the effect was still um, seen and observed at week 48 while off treatment. And although the decline in surface antigen from baseline was only very modest, they did show that 5% of the treated patients achieve um, surface antigen loss. Another immunological target is the blockade of immunosuppressive pathways, such as PD-1 and also CTLA-4, which are often upregulated in chronic hepatitis B infection and can be associated with T cell exhaustion and also with the uh, persistence of chronic viral infection. And in fact, several checkpoint in modulators are already approved for use in oncology, including HCC patients, and therefore are readily available to explore um, in, 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 in our chronic hepatitis B patients. And these checkpoint inhibitors may actually potentially restore the T cell dysfunction or exhaustion that sometimes can occur with chronic hepatitis B infection. And in this phase one study of nivolumab with or without therapeutic vaccination, um, you can see that a slight reduction of service antigen level was observed. Again, although the reduction appears to be very modest only, you can see there was only one patient, there was at least one patient out of the 22, so roughly around uh, 5% who achieved a functional cure of loss of service antigen. Now, to achieve a functional cure, the CCC DNA inside the nuclei of infected hepatocytes must be targeted. These CCC DNA actually forms a very stable pool of template that is pivotal in viral replication and also production of viral proteins. And there are several potential methods to target the CCC DNA. Firstly, one can inhibit its formation, which means that everything downstream is also inhibited, including the transcription of hepatitis B virus protein and also with subsequent replication. Other methods include CCC DNA silencing. We've seen some examples of this using RNA interference, whereby you can actually um, cause destruction of the mRNA and subsequent transcription of and translation of viral logical proteins. And of course, CCC DNA can be eliminated using different methods. Again, this will be important in chronic infections whereby there's already an established pool of CCC DNA and you need to actually actively eliminate um, these active pools. However, at this moment in time, there are actually no drugs targeting CCC DNA and it is unlikely that there will be any in the very near future. Having said that, this table highlights the numerous agents actually going through various stages of our clinical development currently um, with compounds already, some already in, in phase two trials. So hopefully we will see some of these come through into clinical practice in the not so distant future. And it is likely that these agents, when it comes through, will be used as uh, part of combination therapy, targeting different aspects to achieve a functional cure. An example of this would include the use of agents to inhibit viral replication, like the current nucleoside and nucleotide analogs, to lower the virological uh, viral antigen burden by the use of siRNA, and also to boost or enhance the host immune response um, in order to achieve a functional cure. So in summary, oral antiviral therapies alone without hepatitis B immunoglobulin are very effective, highly effective actually, in preventing hepatitis B reactivation after liver transplantation for chronic hepatitis B patients with excellent long-term survival. Um, liver transplantation, remember, is not a cure for chronic viral infection such as hepatitis B and therefore lifelong prophylaxis is required. And current oral antiviral therapy is very highly effective in suppressing replication, but not effective in achieving a functional cure in terms of service antigen loss. However, many upcoming novel agents targeting different parts of the hepatitis B cycle and host immune response are in various stages of clinical trials. And therefore, um, antiviral efficacy, proven safety, well tolerated, and are likely to become available in the near future. The functional cure will be likely to be achieved by, as I said, using a combination of different agents, but a whole host of questions still remains, such as the optimal number of agents to use, which combinations you'd be using, the optimal number of dosages of treatment, especially those requiring parenteral treatment, and also the optimal duration of therapy. And finally, complete and sterilizing cure is currently unlikely to be achieved in the very near future. 
So I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pang, for that uh, excellent overview. Um, I think that uh, a lot of us uh, uh, initially thought that with the advent of antivirals, uh, hepatitis C would be pretty much a done deal, but uh, as you've shown very convincingly with your data, this is a problem that will be developed uh, even after transplantation. So there's one question uh, uh, from the floor from Dr. Harshal Rajekar asking how important is the DNA status at the time of the transplantation? The um, that's a very good question. And I think back in the days when we first started liver transplant, um, the level of HPV DNA was actually an important uh, protector of outcome because they only had HPV and perhaps lamivudine only. And at the time, a higher um, DNA at the time may lead to a higher risk of resistance. But now, nowadays, it is almost, we don't actually look at it as, 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 a, as, as a decision maker. So we don't see it as an, as, an, as, as an important factor. And I've already shown in one of the slides, in fact, that over 75% of our patients, or around three quarters of our patients, are actually viremic at the time of transplant. And up to about half of them overhead, about four to five blocks or over. And again, once you, once you do the transplant, you remove the liver. In fact, you remove the bulk of the virus, including all the CCC DNA and all the integrated DNA inside the liver. I'm talking about inside. So you have a massive drop. So whatever happens, pre-transplant, eight or seven logs, even six logs, et cetera, after transplant, if you do the viral load immediately, you're going to find that it's going to become very low. And if you keep them on antiviral therapy, it's going to gradually fall to become undetectable. So, that, that's, that's so it's, it's not, so it's not, a, not an, an issue. And I think that's the reason why you can actually see a lot why there's such a high rate of service antigen serial clearance after transplant, even without giving them any HPEG at all. Because again, you're removing the bulk of the viral particles, but you're actually not removing everything because you still have extra hepatic sources. You, they're still in the white cells and the spleen and the kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, but to answer your question about uh, the importance of viral load at the time of transplant in this day and age, I don't think it is um, a very important aspect at all. Rajiv has uh, joined us. Uh, I think he's just scrubbed out. Yeah. Uh, hi, James. Uh, Hello. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for asking me. <laughs> no, no, it's nice to see you great. again. Yes. Yeah, nice to see you. And uh, I do hope, you know, we'll be able to get it out here for one of the next sessions of the Frontiers. Yes, I, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it, actually. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, great talk, great talk, James. And, uh, you know, thank I know you. that, um, I know that, uh, you know, Queen Mary was one of the first places to use uh, you know, core positive uh, living donors uh, for uh, transplantation in the yes. written numerous papers uh, on, on their safety. And certainly we are also turning to using a few selected core positive donors here. I mean, yes. uh, my, uh, recently we had a discussion in our MDG listing meeting, um, you know, about, about uh, the uh, possibility of considering a surface antigen positive donors yes. for, fact, for. Yes. So what are the views on that in the, in yes. the, in the you know, Yes. So there's, I mean, for core positive, there's actually no issues at all. You already know yeah. that. Um, for service antigen positive donors, um, in fact, we also have started um, a protocol to use that. Again, it's, it's, you, it's, it's only reserved for hepatitis B carriers, so you're not passing a new infection, but they must undergo a very stringent workup beforehand. So they must have a of, uh, histology, they must have imaging, they must have the alpha feeder protein, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And they must be below a, a certain age. I think our protocol currently is about the age of 55. Um, and anything above that we try not to use because there may be established fibrosis, even though we may not pick it up. And, and also after transplantation, of course, these patients are going to be at a higher, well, they're going to be at a lifelong risk of HCC. So irrespective of, the, of whatever their initial primary liver disease was, they will need lifelong surveillance for HCC. So it's different with, you know, in a person who have no HCC, so a person who has fulminant hepatitis B or acute flare of hepatitis B, they get transplanted with a normal liver, they're not going to get the no HCC. But if you transplant a surface antigen positive liver inside that person, that surface antigen positive liver is going to be at risk of developing HCC in the lifelong process, just like any other normal chronic hepatitis B carrier. So that's that's one key difference. Yeah. Um, we don't accept, I know Taiwan has done a few studies 
um, looking at living donor liver transplantation and using serous antigen positive donors. But um, that, I don't think that is, is, that, that is a, a, an ethical option at all because those patients who are actually service antigen positive, again, they will have a lifelong risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And if he develops an HCC and he's already undergone a hepatectomy, then the treatment options for that patient is going to be much, much less. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so the message is that, you know, so for a living donor, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, positive living donor is still, yeah, still, we don't, still we don't, not yeah, really. Yeah. 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 I don't think okay. it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.